Welcome everyone to today's Synergist webinar, Taking Care of My FR. I'm Ed Rutkowski, Editor-in-Chief of the Synergist, the magazine of AIHA. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and especially Bulwark for sponsoring this webinar. I'm pleased to welcome back today's speaker, Derek Sang, who has been involved with the flame-resistant clothing industry for over 20 years. Derek has worked directly with end users developing and implementing flame-resistant clothing programs specific to the customer's hazards. More recently, Derek has worked closely with Fortune 1000 companies as they develop FR clothing programs, educating them on fabrics and FR technologies, as well as the dynamics of arc flash and flash fire hazards. Over the course of his career, Derek has developed and conducted over 250 educational and informational seminars on the hazards of arc flash and flash fire. In his current position as a technical training manager, Derek has developed over 40 hours of training curriculum for the Bulwark Institute. These training efforts cover all aspects of FR clothing and are delivered utilizing live class courses, online training, webinars, and in-person seminars. In addition to being a recognized subject matter expert, Derek is also a qualified safety sales professional, a certified environmental health and safety professional, and a certified safety health and environmental technician. Now I'll turn the presentation over to Derek. Ed, as always, thank you for that kind introduction, and good morning and or good afternoon if you're listening to us live and or archived. I certainly appreciate you taking your valuable time to spend a few minutes today with us talking about taking care of our flame-resistant arc-related clothing and can we mess it up. So first and foremost, let's get the attorneys out of the way. Uh, this presentation is for informational purposes only. Customers of Bulwer Protection are solely responsible for conducting their own hazard risk assessment to identify safety hazards in their work environment. Customers of Bulwer Protection are solely responsible for selecting appropriate garments and protective gear for their employees and ensuring wearers use the garments and protective gear properly and in conjunction with the appropriate gloves and footwear. Because working conditions and other factors may vary, Bulwer Protection does not make any representation that these garments protective gear will protect wearers from injury. So with that, on to the good stuff. When we're out in the field and we're talking to our end user community, the folks that actually don our flame resistant arc rated clothing because they have exposure to short duration thermal events, we get lots of questions in and around how to properly care for this stuff and maintain it and can I mess it up? All going well in the 45 minutes that we'll spend here today, and with your insight in questions at the end, we will figure out who's responsible for care and maintenance. We'll talk about uh, best practices and top laundry uh, tips. What about mosquitoes and ticks and additives that we can put and can't put on our gear? And uh, should I use an industrial laundry? Is it okay to launder it at home? And all going well, we'll answer that question, can we mess it up? So with a few quick definitions, uh, fire retardant, clothing is not fire retardant. It's the chemical additives that go into uh, the fabric and fibers that suppress fire by interrupting the fire flow tetrahedron. And there's a whole 45 minutes on how we do that and what phases we can do that in. Flame resistant is the actual byproduct of all that stuff that we do, whether we do it at the molecular level, the fiber level, or the fabric level. And all that means is the garment will put itself out once the ignition source is gone. And by doing that, ultimately it becomes a life-saving piece of equipment. Uh, we're trying to get away from the old terms that you may have heard, and they're still pretty prevalent in the marketplace. Uh, terms like inherent. The fiber does not support combustion. Treated, fiber needs additional finishing in order to not support combustion. But because the technologies have advanced so far and there's no real uh, true one fiber, one fabric solutions anymore, they're all hybrids and combinations of, we want to look at the term FR engineering. And where does that engineering occur? Because at the end of the day, there is not a flame-resistant plant, flame-resistant tree. I can't grow something and then we make a fiber and weave fabric out of it. As a human being, I have to engineer it at either the molecular level, the fiber level, or the fabric level. All that matters to us as the wearer 
is it durable? Is it durable to laundering, meaning I can't get it out? And is it durable to normal wear and tear, meaning I'll get some reasonable ROI on my investment? Uh, arc rated uh, is additional testing that we take flame resistant fabrics to in order to tell you how much uh, it can insulate and protect you in an arc flash incident. Uh, you'll hear me use the term today, FRAR. FR first, everything must first and foremost be flame resistant, and then AR is arc ready. And when I talk in these terms, uh, I'm specific to our brand. All our garments have an arc rating. So by default, they're all first and foremost flame resistant. So can I mess this stuff up? FRAR properties of today's proven suppliers are for the life of that garment and are therefore durable, as I said, not just to laundering, but also to wear and tear. It's key to understand that you can and cannot do as a wearer and what you need to be aware of as an employer. Uh, it's pretty good today. Uh, as I said, 25 years ago, there were some advantages. There was only a few players. We knew what the makeup of everything was. We knew what the pros and cons were. It was a relatively simple uh, marketplace. About four to five uh, fabrics dominated it. I tell folks I worked in, in this arena when you could get any style, any color of navy blue Nomex cover all you wanted. Uh, there were very few shirts and pants. There were very few fiber fabric options. And hence, you could get any Nomex coverall you wanted because they dominated and primarily dominated in the petrochem arena. Where we are today, it's dramatically different. There's different fiber uh, combinations. They all have their pros and cons. We're, believe it or not, weaving non-FR entities into our FR solutions to provide other advantages like moisture wicking, antimicrobial, static discharge, all these things are happening within this space, so it is relatively different today than it was 25 years ago. With that, who's responsible for what? When determining who's responsible, it's actually pretty easy. Um, everything, the umbrella, you look at your general duty clause, it's the employer. The vast majority of our regulations, vast majority of our standards, all point to the employer as far as uh, being responsible, and that includes selecting the proper gear, specifying the proper gear, having something in writing I can hand to my short-term or contract employees to tell them what they need to get, uh, how to properly use it. That means I've got to train you. And then part of that training is, is once you have this, how do you properly care for and maintain it? And at the end of the day, regardless of how that happens, the employer still re has the last right of refusals, whether to that they determine that care and maintenance is up to their standards. Meaning, if I got a guy walking on a job site and he's got holes in his knees, a ripped off back pocket, his sleeves are threadbare, and three of his buttons are missing, and I allow him to continue on, that's my responsibility. I simply need to stop that. And people kind of get a little panicky when it comes to, now I'm the clothing fleet. We police or should be policing everything from a PPE standpoint. We see a guy with a cracked hard hat, get a new hard hat. We don't let him work. We see one of our other employees missing a lens in their safety glasses. We don't allow that. One earmuff is off our hearing protection. And I know I'm being extreme here, but we make PPE decisions on what our folks can and cannot wear on the job site all the time. This is just another piece. And it's just, again, even though common sense may mean all that common anymore, that's where we are. We're legislating common sense, so to speak. So the regulations say, the law says, in 1910-132, the employer shall assess the workplace to determine if hazards are present or are likely to be present, which necessitates the use of personal protective equipment. In doing that, you're required to select the proper PPE to protect against that hazard. If you have an electrical hazard, 
it's not just FR clothing. It's FR clothing that has an ARC rating. It's going to have an ATPV or an ESUB-BT, which are a recognized ARC rating, and it's going to give you a number so you can correlate that to the incident energy, a.k.a. the hazard. If you have a flash fire uh, or short duration thermal exposure from fire, you're going to look to NFPA uh, 2112 compliant garments, and you're going to implement or use the 2113 standard to guide you through the proper implementation and training in and around that. So you have your law that says protect your people. It says you have to do this under the PPE law, 132. Your standards are your playbook as a safety person and how to comply to what the law is telling you that you have to do. So I have to go and select this stuff. What are some of the things in this complex marketplace that can help me get the right stuff for my people? Well, one of the things that we're required to do as manufacturers is follow strict guidelines in communicating to you on what this stuff is designed to do and how that manifests itself in the real world is labels. Yes, I know you get a FR, AR shirt, pant, or cover. And the first thing you go is, why are there so many darn labels on here? Because we have to communicate a lot of stuff to you. And if we are a conscientious supplier, we're going to follow the guidelines in the standards and communicate it to you in a certain way. ASTM 1506 requires that we communicate all these things on our tag just for the electric arc flash hazard. That's going to let you know ultimately what is the protective insulative component to this garment so I can match it up with the incident energy that I'm up against, a.k.a. if I've done my arc flash hazard analysis, and I know that this piece of equipment that I'm working on is six calories, I know I have to be at least 6.1 arc rating. I can then correlate that with the label. But the label also gives you a lot of other things. That's where your care and maintenance instructions are. That's also where uh, the origin is. And the other thing is if it's ever in an incident, that's where your chain of custody is. It's going to give you all the tracking information, when it was made, where it was made, what roll of fabric it came off, so we can trace back to the original test data that was on that fabric, and then we can look at the two and see if this fabric performed as it did and make sure that everything was up to snuff or if it didn't do it. So we have that just for our arc flash hazard. In our 2112 short duration uh, thermal exposures to fire, or more commonly our flash fire hazard, we also have strict requirements in communicating to you all the things that are going on here. And specifically for this, you're going to have, as in our garments and others, you'll have your UL logo, which is identifying your independent third-party certifier that these garments are 2112 compliant, so they are built for the hazards you're actually looking to uh, protect your people against. So labels are a very, very good way when you're in that selection process or in that specification process to make sure you're getting the right stuff. Now, are they infallible? Absolutely not. Is there counterfeit stuff out there? Believe it or not, unfortunately, yes, there is. Is there bad labels? Yes, they are. And if you haven't educated yourself to at least a bare minimum to understand what they should look like, some of that stuff can float in. You'll see terms like been tested to. That is meaningless in our world because all I did is tell you that I failed because if I tested to something and did not pass, that's what I just communicated. If I tested to you and I passed, I would tell you that I am certified to be compliant. So it sounds like it's the same, but when you understand what they should be communicating, it's going to allow you to eliminate and cut down that list and get down to those four or five quality suppliers that you want to have on your facility because they're doing things correctly. So training, 
That's the next piece. So I select this stuff, and now we're going to put it into the field. Uh, do I just hand my PPE to my people and expect them to know how to use it? No, we don't do that. Now, some training is relatively simple. How to don a hard hat, how to don safety glasses, how to don earplugs. Uh, other training, fall harnesses, can be quite complex, and you need to have uh, certified folks in order to, to do training on those things and make sure that your people are following the proper procedures for donning and doffing. And your flame-resistant arc-rated clothing falls somewhere in between. Not as complex as, say, a fall harness, but not quite as simple as, say, a hard hat. So we have to walk them through when it's necessary, what is necessary, and how to properly care for it. And in and there, we're also communicating what it can and cannot do. The toughest thing is, is when I don this PPE, you've got to let people know that you're one, you're not Superman, it's not a super suit of armor, you're not impervious to injury, and you're definitely not running into burning buildings and saving babies. There are limitations to this. Well, what are the limitations? For example, in our flash fire world, these are built to a three second or less short duration thermal exposure to fire. So if I determine that because my folks are in a well hole and egress is not easy and my egress is going to go from anywhere from seven to eight seconds due to the fact that I've got to get out and orient myself and all those things, do I want to be in something that's providing three seconds or less protection in an eight-second hazard? No. You would have to reevaluate, reevaluate your PPE selection, et cetera. Proper care and maintenance of flame-resistant arc rate is essential for its effectiveness. Like any other PPE, you have to take care of it in order for it to do its job. And its job is saving your life. What I like to tell folks is we build flame-resistant clothing to ultimately save you in an arc flash or a flash fire hoping you have never have to use it for what I build it for. Or we build life-saving equipment that accidentally happens to look like a shirt, pant, or coverall. But at the end of the day, it can't do its job if it's not worn correctly, if it's not maintained properly, and if it's not reasonably clean, it's not going to be able to do as well as it could. Hence, you could be hurt a lot more than you needed to be and when that hurt is a second or third degree burn, you definitely want to do your best in this area to help mitigate that. We provide standards, or I should say the marketplace has standards on how to proper launder and care and maintain this stuff. You've got ASTM F2757, and you've got ASTM F1449. One is for home care and one is for industrial laundries. So it's well documented on what we need to do in order to make sure that this stuff gets to you in a condition to where it needs to do its job. And remember, its job is not a shirt, pant, or coverall. Its ultimate job is a life-saving piece of equipment. With that being said, all the standards basically tell you the same thing. Now, it would be nice to get some uniform, pardon the pun, language and have all our important standards basically utilizing the same verbiage, but if you read the sections, they're all saying the same thing. Follow the manufacturer's guidelines. If you want more information, for example, in 1506, they talk about 2757 and 1449. In 2113, they're saying things that are important, like you should wash your FR clothing once before donning it for wear. In fact, you should do that with any and all FR and non-FR clothing. Don't wear stuff brand new. You should automatically get it laundered, get rid of all that sizing, get rid of all the other things that's going into the cutting and sewing process. When they're looking at rolls of fabric and we've got them stacked 12, 14, 18 inches high and they're using laser cutters and there's a whole 
bunch of additives in there to stop slippage and everything. Get that stuff out. Again, regardless if it's FR or non-FR, if it's your favorite pair of jeans, your favorite uh, you know, T-shirt on the weekend, just wash everything one time uh, to get that stuff removed. And then lastly, launder or, or, or dry cleaning with frequency to prevent buildup of contaminants. Makes sense. And all the standards allow for additional removal, and we'll talk about that, of uh, stubborn stuff. You can always take it to the dry cleaner. So, again, there's lots of areas in here to where there should be no misunderstanding on what you need to do as far as caring for it. And, again, on that label, if you take time to read the fine print, we give you all the instructions. And that's the cool thing about it. We've gotten to the point where it's relatively simple. I mean, if I can get it on a small label and find enough print to where it's still readable, it's not complicated. But it's important that you read and understand what you can and cannot do. Uh, most top manufacturers today are going to have downloadable PDFs. You can hop on all their websites and get uh, proper care and maintenance. Uh, there's folks that have made uh, magnets and things like that, so you can throw it on your washer and dryer to, to walk you through when you're there, just as a reminder. So again, once we get to this point where we are today, it's relatively hard to mess this stuff up if you do some simple things. So what are the basics? The basics are use plain old liquid detergent. Now, is that mandatory? Can we still use, as long as your powders and things like that don't have any uh, color safe bleach, other kind of additives, as long as they're just detergent, sure. But ideally, just use liquid detergent. Avoid chlorine, avoid peroxides, avoid fabric softener, both in the liquid and the dryer sheets. And stay away from spraying anything additional on it, AKA starch, anything, et cetera, like that. And that's all you really have to do. There's a few other points you want to keep in mind, but of the six things you think here, all are bad actors except for one, the guy in the middle. Plain old liquid detergent, avoid all the other stuff, and it's relatively easy to do. I don't know anybody who's putting bleach on their navy coveralls, don't put bleach on their denim jeans, you won't find but a few outliers that even allow white FR. Why? Because we don't want you bleaching it. It's not that we can't make it. It's we don't want you bleaching it. The only real sneaky one in this whole thing is your quote-unquote OxyClean because it doesn't come out and directly tell you that it's peroxide. But peroxide and chlorine both do the same kind of thing. They're going to weaken your fibers. Think about it. You've got a seven ounce, six and a half ounce, five and a half ounce work shirt in a eight to 10,000 degree arc flash with 1,900 degrees of molten metal copper shrapnel flying at you at 750 miles an hour, and you're relying on the fabric and its integrity to insulate and protect you in that hazard. So don't do stuff to weaken your outer armor. And that's all we're telling you to do here. As I said, they're relatively easy. Now, nothing that I'm going to tell you here in this top 10 is written anywhere in the standards. When you've been doing FR for over 40 plus years as we have, we pick up some best practices along the way. So when you look at uh, is there a law? No, there's no law that tells you how to do it. What do the standards say? Follow the manufacturer's guidelines. Well, what are some best practices then? Real simple. You've heard me say it, and I'm going to keep echoing it because it's important. No bleach or peroxide. Uh, stay away from really kind of any additives. They're going, to, they're going to accumulate over time, whether that's a petrochemical-based uh, softener like your fabric softener, or that's something like starch over time, just don't do it. Now, if you happen to do any of those two aforementioned things, starch and fabric softener, accidentally, just rewash them. You haven't compromised the integrity where you can't wash it out and return it away. Just stop the accumulation. Uh, wash your FRAR, or AKA, wash your work clothes separately from your family clothes. 
That's just, you know, that's just a best practice. Uh, turn your garments inside out if you want to keep that nice color retention. We do that with our non-FR stuff too. Uh, use liquid detergent for best uh, results. Avoid the hottest temperatures to reduce the impact of shrinkage because a lot of the, the, uh, the fiber fabric uh, combos now today are going to have a lot of uh, cellulosic and natural fibers in there for comfort. So you're going to want to minimize uh, shrinkage along those lines. Uh, tough stains, soak garments in liquid detergent. You can use your shout it out. You can use your other additives and then just launder them. Uh, for tougher stains, like I said, you can always take them to be dry cleaned. Tumble dry on low, low settings uh, is ideal. And then rewash garments if you have any lingering odor, and we'll talk about that uh, in more detail shortly. One of the things we always get, especially now we're starting to tail off uh, as we go into the, the winter ones, but vector-borne disease season seems to be getting longer and longer. Uh, we're having hotter, longer uh, springs and falls, and we're seeing uh, our uh, mosquitoes and ticks lasting longer. You can't use DEET. DEET is an accelerant. DEET's flash point is about 300 degrees. An arc flash, as I mentioned, uh, 10 to 12 inches outside that box is 8,000 to 5,000 degrees. You're going to hit the flash point. Uh, a, a flash fire or short duration thermal exposure uh, from fire is anywhere from uh, 800 to 2,000 degrees. You're hitting that flash point. So what can you do? A little bit of research. Uh, there are uh, garments out there that come uh, with a treatment already on them. Uh, it's a permethrin-based uh, treatment. It is part of the garment. It has a life cycle of about uh, a year to two years, depending on your laundry process. Again, it's an additive. It's not going to be permanent. Uh, there are some permethrin-based uh, sprays and things right now that are out there that are deemed to be FR safe. I strongly recommend that you do your homework. Make sure if you're going to utilize it that you test it on the fabric fiber combinations that you have because the ones that we've seen have not been uh, across the full panel of available fabrics. It'll be good on some and not so good on others, uh, but there are options out there. Stay away from DEET at an absolute though, please. How much is too much? How much secondary accelerant should we tolerate in our workplace, and what about uh, staining and things like that? Well, first and foremost, discoloration, staining in and of itself, if the garment is clean, meaning there is no residual odor of fuel, you have not compromised the FR properties. All a stain is a stain. It doesn't mean the FR properties have been compromised. Now, Monitor the accumulation on your garments throughout the workday. A little may be okay. A lot, I need to get you out of harm's way. If that means getting you out of the bucket and out of mad or off the rig into the locker room and into clean stuff, get you out of harm's way. After laundering, and this is key, if I'm laundering at home or I have a third party doing my laundry, be careful of accelerant odor, a.k.a. the old sniff test. If you take that garment and you can smell fuel, guess what your garment is? It is fuel. Rewash until that odor is gone or you will have to retire that garment because that fuel will be used up in that short duration thermal exposure while you're wearing it and we don't want that. So what can that look like? Our two examples here, the one as you're looking at the screen to your left, is that too much? Well, after laundering, if it's clean and it doesn't smell of secondary exposure, that's just a large stain. During the workday, if that's secondary accelerant, I would probably get me out of harm's way. Out of the bucket, off the rig, I would be in the locker room changing if feasible, if not feasible, definitely out of the hazard. To the right, again, no odor, no fuel. If throughout the workday, this is my accumulation, probably 90% of you here on the call would say, hey, that's fair. What will that result in? You're going to have a hot spot. That fuel will be consumed by that energy. Uh, the FR fabric will be doing its job and self, uh, 
self-extinguishing and you may have some uh, significant damage in those areas and possibly could transfer to first, second degree burns, but that's not a lot. That would be something that, hey, we can still work within our day because we still have to be able to do our jobs. So again, just to recap, discoloration and staining in and of itself is not a compromise or an indicator of reduction in protection. So beyond proper cleaning, uh, what should we look for? Obviously, caring and maintaining these garments. I want to inspect them. Uh, similar to an electrician inspecting his rubber gloves on a daily basis or after each use basis, similar to anybody who has to wear fall protection and wear a fall harness, I'm going to look for what? On my fall harness, I'm looking for cuts. I'm looking for frays. I'm looking for, uh, you know, all my D-rings and everything haven't been compromised. As I am with my other PPE, I'm checking my respirator. I'm doing all these things. This is PPE. At the start of the day, I'm going to monitor, does it still correctly fit me? Has it gained, has it lost some size, or have I gained some size to where it's now too tight and could be compromising me if I were in a short-duration thermal event? How's the integrity? Look at your main stressing seams. Look at... Uh, look at the crotch area, shoulder area, elbows, knees, thighs, check all those. And then obviously, you know, staining, particularly if they're oily, sticky, or smelly. And then re remove them from service if you can't repair them. Little rule of thumb, always keep a few extra garments that you have worn out throughout the years. That's going to be your source for repairs. Uh, that's going to be your source for patching. Uh, can you do it? I'm somewhat torn. You, can, you should be able to hear the stressor in my voice when people ask me, Derek, what do I need to do to repair this stuff? Oh, I want to say just go get new ones. Don't. The integrity has been broken, go get new ones. That's a hard thing to say because obviously that's going to cost money. Can you repair this stuff? Technically, yes, you can. Are there guidelines? Yes, there are. Like materials, that's why you're going to keep that shirt or pant. And FR thread, that's Nomex thread, Aramid thread. Go on that Google box, punch in, hopefully somewhere on Amazon. There's an easy purchase. You're going to get the colors that you need. And then you can sit there and repair your garments at home. Your industrial launderer, they're going to unthread their sewing machine. They're going to have a stockpile of uh, like material patching kits. And then they're going to use Aramid thread and their appropriate patching kits. Make sure it's Nomex on Nomex. Make sure it's Tecase Plus on Tecase Plus. And make sure we're not mixing and matching. So there is some coaching there that needs to get done. And there's some policing that needs to be done and you're going to want to ensure that they're doing the right things by you because you don't want a non-FR patch on there and you don't want non-FR threads on there. You want it done correctly if you're going to do it at all. So with that being said, what is the best practice? Because my standards are not going to tell me what I need to do. So here is our guideline. The OK sign. Is it okay to repair this stuff? Reluctantly, I say, okay, go ahead. Why? Because that's going to tell you what you can do. It is a nickel size hole and three inches, one of each per garment. That means I can have a rip or a tear, three inches of less, and I can repair it. And I can have a hole the size of a nickel or less, and I can patch it. One of each on each garment, and that's it. There's your guideline. So is it okay to repair it? Yes. Three inches and a nickel, one of each, and then after that, you're going to have to retire it. Because remember, its integrity, its life-saving component has somewhat been compromised in those areas. So when we're cleaning them, when should I consider an industrial laundry and when should I look at home laundering? Well, they all have their pros and cons. There is no one absolute that's perfect for everybody, but what are some of the things that I should think about? Do I have a high soil environment? Do I have an environment that contains contaminants, a.k.a. stuff I don't want to bring home? 
aka stuff I can't get my residential water temperatures high enough to really get it out. I am going to look for some assistance and look at a third-party industrial launderer for that. The logistics make sense. They are right around the corner. They are within my city limits. They are within my general geographical area to where it makes sense and it's easy enough to do. And it's easy enough to get them to respond to changes in the environment, set up measuring dates for new hires, do all the things from a customer service standpoint that's not going to take them three to four hours to just to get to you. High turnover. We are in a lot of contractors, a lot of turnover. I want to have some bulk programs. We have a lot of folks who are on site temporarily. We don't want to make the huge investment in all this stuff, but we need to have it available. And we are comfortable having a simplified product line. We only accept a few colors. We're limiting ourselves to just coveralls, a few shirts and pants. It's relatively simple. When should I consider home laundering? Well, the easy part would just say, just go the opposite of everything that I just said, and you're in the home laundry environment. So what's that? Low to medium soil. Little or no concern of contaminants going home. Logistics are a challenge. My employees are all over the place. My employees service the United States. My employees service all of Alabama. My employees are constantly flying from place to place. There is no central pickup and delivery availability. My folks are pretty tenured. Okay, We want to have some flexibility in how we look, what our brand is, and my people want to have a choice in what they're wearing. These are my long-term trusted employees. It's something that makes sense. It's going to add to the buy-in. Lots of advantages there. That all being said, in today's world, when you look at some of our top industrial launderers, they have the ability to do it all. They have the ability to work with you from a direct sales standpoint. They have ability to work with you on an NOG, not their garment, but they can provide laundering, and they can also provide services for the whole facility in a sense that, hey, we'll take care of high soil, we'll take care of this. We have other providers who do an excellent, outstanding job of giving you everything you want and not tying you into one thing. And when the latest and greatest technology is available, they can just integrate it right into your program. So mixing and maxing, having a hybrid today is very possible, and it doesn't take but a few phone calls and a couple of inquiries to mesh everything up together. Technically, there is no one perfect solution, hence you should have availability to it all. So real quick in the checklist here, then we'll get ready to wrap up with a little bonus section based on the environment we're in today. So when folks are asking me, what should we be looking for, Derek? What are some of the things that I want folks to check off? First and foremost, whoever you're looking at, when it comes to the garments, get to the manufacturer of the garments. That's where the rubber meets the road. The fabric is fine, everything else, but the manufacturer, the one who's putting what you wear together, ultimately has to guarantee in writing on their letterhead and sign that this is for the life of the garment and it will do its job, not just to a standard. I can guarantee to a standard why it's minimal. ASTM 1506 is 25 launderings. You are going to wear that garment more than 25 times. So if I only guarantee to meet ASTM 1506, my guarantee is virtually useless because on the 26th laundering, it's just over. So make sure it's for the life of that garment. Ask for the test data for the hazard that the garment's going to be in, or if it's a combination of hazards, make sure that you've got all the hazards that you are looking to protect against, that you've got the data, and those garments are going to meet or exceed that. Any certifications, make sure that those are there. And also verify. Verify test data and verify certifications. All your top manufacturers today can easily direct you to the source of the testing and the certification, and you can be able to verify it. If it takes you more than two, three, 
probably not the best supplier or manufacturer you want to be dealing with. Specify that only certified compliant garments are along your site. Uh, work with proven supply chain partners. Uh, I say that and I echo that because that's not important when everything is going well. That checkbox is when things go bad. That checkbox is when you have to make that call at 6 o'clock in the morning to your distributor who's then going to call the manufacturer It says, Unfortunately, we had an incident last night. One of my folks is hurt, and we need to get everybody together, and we need to find out what happened. We're required to keep the data on every single roll of fabric for, for 10 years. We can trace back to the actual roll uh, that shirt, pant, and coverall came from, when it was made, where it was made. We can get down to the micron level, tell you how hot that fabric got, whether there's any secondary accelerants, and did it ultimately do what it was designed to do, or did something impede it from doing its performance? If you have to get onto a 1-800 customer service number that takes you two continents away, what do you think the chances of them getting on a plane to come help you is? Whatever you saved in purchasing that shirt pant is gone. That 30 bucks, that 20 bucks, whatever it is, at $25,000 a day in a burn unit, any single day that I spend in a burn unit that I didn't have to, is going to eat up any cost savings that you had over your entire program for a number of years in a very, very short period of time. So work with proven supply chain partners. And then periodically police your program for compliance because they can get out of whack because just because I have one shirt panther coverall that meets your spec doesn't mean everything in my catalog that your folks have been ordering from does. So periodically police the program. The answer to the question is, is it taking care? Can you mess it up? No, it's pretty hard. I mean, you really have to work over time to mess this stuff up from doing its primary function and that's self-extinguishing and saving your life. But the asterisk in that statement comes when you're working with proven supply chain partners. Uh, regardless of the FR engineering or combination of FR engineering is that the FR properties are for the life of that garment and they're therefore durable not just to laundering but to also wear and tear. But thanks to the regulations, thanks to the standards that are always updating and changing and getting better, and thank you to you and the market demanding that we do a good job, uh, extensive testing and development and protection, comfort and durability is the best it's ever been. 25 plus years now, really a fiber and fabric innovation and development is taking it there. And the market, you folks driving manufacturers from Peru around not just comfort, not just durability, not just lightweight, but things like moisture wicking, high air perm, moisture vapor transfer, to create a truly performance-based flame-resistant arc rate workwear that 10 years ago we couldn't even have thought of. So where we are today is so much better than where we were uh, when I first started all those so many years ago. So before we get into Q&A, a couple of real slides quick in and around where we are today in the coronavirus pandemic. What we are communicating to our folks at the end of the day is what I'm calling one big don't and three do's. So real quick, what is the big don't? Don't share PPE. The first word in PPE in that acronym is personal. It's your personal PPE, don't share it. That's even down to the level of gloves, hard hats, face shields, anything along those lines, something especially that I'm breathing into or on, be very, very conscious that you are not sharing that. Where that gets to be a real challenge is in our arc flash kit arena. Why? Most companies, I may have all day, every day, eight calories or greater, or what's called Cat 2 and 70E, shirts, pants, and coveralls. Those are mine. They hang in my closet or they go to my industrial launderer with my personal ID tags on them and no one else has my stuff. But when it comes to kits, I might have two of each size in my electrical room and 
those hoods that I am breathing into, be very, very conscious that we are going through extensive uh, cleaning and sanitizing of that gear, and it's not easily done in the field. So be very conscious of it. There are different surfaces there that need to be uh, cleaned and sanitized. Get with your manufacturers on your flash suits and make sure that you're using the appropriate cleaning solutions and systems in order to ensure that those are uh, not going to infect anybody. Three do's. Uh, one, if you are working throughout your day and you have no concern regarding possible contamination, that doesn't mean that you don't. You just have little or no concern. Hey, I started out, everything's fine, good. Normal manufacturer's guidelines when it comes to laundering, just follow it. Why? If 20 seconds of soap and hot water on your hands is enough to nullify that virus, 30 minutes inside your laundry in hot water and then into your dryer is going to more and nullify any kind of uh, viral agent from that standpoint. So there is no need for special handling. Now, if you have concern, follow the CDC guidelines. It's relatively simple. Uh, doff your clothing away from uh, anywhere else in an isolated area. Pick up your clothing. Do not shake it. Take it to your washer. Put it in, appropriate, uh, you know, sanitizing of the hands before you start touching your bottles and everything that other people could be touched. Wash your hands, sanitize them, then follow the manufacturer's guidelines. Back to my comment earlier on the previous slide and do a few little steps in there. Good to go. Tools. Uh, sanitize and clean your tools. Uh, wear disposable gloves uh, to clean and disinfect uh, clean surfaces using soap and water when possible. Uh, then disinfect. Uh, cleaning with soap and water, obviously we just talked about, same as again, we are uh, nullifying and uh, taking care of the virus from that standpoint. Practice routine cleaning uh, of frequently touched surfaces. When it comes to your FR though, if possible, you are out of harm's way. If you are cleaning your truck or if you're cleaning something that you've been occupying on a daily basis, you're definitely not doing it in, in the MAD. You're definitely not doing it in the arc flash boundary. Change out of your arc rated clothing. Uh, when you're dealing with bleach and other kind of uh, cleaning solutions, get out of your arc rated clothing. Now, if you can't, take an old coverall. Put that on and then do your cleaning. If you have access to disposable coveralls, put those over your very expensive arc-rated flame-resistant, uh, your flame-resistant arc-rated clothing and clean correspondingly. And I tell you all that to say this, if you follow the recommended chlorine bleach disinfecting guidelines by the CDC where we're diluting one third cup for every gallon of water, incidental, accidental exposure to chlorine in this area, though we don't like it, you're not ruining it. We would just rather you didn't do it. Uh, our folks at Tyndale, uh, very good manufacturer, good customer of ours, did some extensive work uh, where they took uh, double the concentration, the ideal concentration, accidental spray, uh, saturated and tested it, and there was no effect on the flame-resistant uh, properties. It still self-extinguished. So I say all that to say if you happen to get it in there, don't panic. You're not ruining your gear 100% completely. But if you can, by all means, get out of that really expensive PPE if you're going to be cleaning your equipment and, and using bleach to do so uh, per the CDC guidelines. So with that, there's my contact information. That's my email at the bottom. Uh, more than happy to answer any questions in and around. It doesn't have to be brand specific. It doesn't have to be in and around what we do. More than happy to help you. Any questions uh, when we go back to Ed here that we don't get to, uh, the nice folks send me the uh, the download of all the questions. I will take my time if I don't have the answers and we don't have the answers internally to whatever you specifically are asking, we've got the resources 
to get you uh, answered, and I'll definitely get that stuff to you. So with that, Ed, I think we've got about 10 minutes. Uh, let's get into some questions. Great. Thanks, Derek. Yes, we got about 10 minutes. Um, just a reminder to all our attendees, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the chat window on the right bottom side of your screen, um, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, our first question, Derek, is how do I know the end life of a piece of FR clothing, especially if there is no obvious or visible wear and tear? <clears throat> Great question, and I'm going to default to kind of what thematically I've been saying through this. Everything that we're talking about is when we're talking about quality manufacturers. And I don't, and it doesn't take too long on your Google search to get down that list of about a half a dozen or so before you start getting concerned. So looking at that half a dozen and above, you don't, if it's in good condition, meaning there are no obvious rips, tears, uh, thread barren, anything like that, all the technologies that we're utilizing today, all that F FR engineering is for the life of that garment. You don't have to track them. Um, now, if you got to the point to where you're like, okay, that's nice, I got you, brand guy, uh, you could always get with us, send in a sampling of what you think has been, on the, been used in the field now for three, four, five years, and we want to find out if it's still FR. We'll take those garments, we'll destroy them, and we'll test them, and we'll give you the results. What we find, again, is with all our top manufacturers, it's never an issue. Now, there are some outliers to where, like, a few things will happen, but when we go and trace those, they're not in that top half dozen or so, and there's reasons why. There's reasons that you have a $180 coverall, and then you have somebody claiming, oh, it's exactly the same for a third of the price. Guess where they cut corners? The easiest place to cut a corner is take that big FR machine because you got the test, you got the number that you wanted, and we dial it way down. You take a lot of cost out of that garment. Are you ever going to know that? Nope, not until the day you need it. So you have to be cautious. When we go back to looking at labels and looking at counterfeit stuff and fraudulent information, uh, don't know who you're buying from, know what their reputation is, and know what you're buying. Okay, thanks, Derek. I've got a two-part uh, COVID-related question here, and uh, it came in before you started uh, addressing COVID at the end of the presentation, so you might have answered this a little bit, but let me read it off to you again. Um, sure. Are you, aware, are you aware of any COVID treatment spray that we can use to treat the FR fabric of, a share, of shared electrical hoods that are not designed to be laundered? Good question. So the tough part is, and, it, and I strongly advise you, I'm going to give you some guidelines, but regardless, if you're with Oberon, if you're with Sal Honeywell Salisbury, if you're with NSA, if you're with Enspro, if you're with, with some of those uh, arc flash suit guys, get with them and verify what all I'm about to say because I'm going to be very, very generalist here. The tough thing is, is you're going to have to dismantle that hood in order to properly clean it. The tough thing is, is they were never built to be dismantled on the frequency that we may be encountering dismantling them under these new conditions. So when you have a polycarbonate type lens, it's going to require uh, a certain chemistry, probably isopropyl alcohol to clean the lens. Then you're going to have to get into the cloth. Now, does spraying the cloth with, and I'll use a brand name here because it's relatively easy, but spraying the cloth with something like a Lysol so I don't have to launder it, will that help? Now, we know that it does with bacteria. Will it help here? That's where I encourage you to get to the manufacturers. Most of my uh, suit guys now are up to date on all that stuff. They're more than happy to share that information. They've been doing their homework as, as we all have since this started, 
uh, on what is a best uh, practice to go about it. So I know that's only a partial answer, and I'm going to default to the folks that uh, manufacture and do that to give you the best answer. If, uh, if you would like, you have my email. Send me the manufacturer. Take a picture of that, and I will get you in touch with the right folks if you're not exactly sure. So uh, I'll put that out there. So hopefully it helped answer a little bit. It probably wasn't best. Uh, but if you get hold of me and you get me who the suit's made by, I'll get you in touch with the right people that can help you. Great. Thanks, Eric. Uh, next question is from Michael. Uh, he asks, do you have any data on skin issues such as dermatitis for clothing that's contacting bare skin? Great question. Uh, we, and I'm going to give you a big, broad brushstroke. What we have seen over, well, I mean, in Bulwark's 40-plus years, in my 25 and my counterparts' similar time, is we do see any time we have a new install. And when we're talking about when we go and we install 500,000 employees into FR Garments, we will see a small percentage, and it can be in and around, it's single digits, it's usually in and that 5 to 3% that will have some feedback regarding that they have some contact dermatitis. Now, usually when we have conversations with those folks, it falls into two categories. One, their job description or their prior job did not require them to wear long sleeves. The long sleeves that they are wearing today are going to be in that six and a half to seven ounce range. If they were wearing long sleeves, it was lighter fabrics. If they weren't wearing long sleeves, they now have throughout the work day, they're moving those joints and they're sweating in those areas and they're having some contact dermatitis. Others we find didn't launder the garments prior to wear. So what we usually see is we tell folks, wash them three to five times, come back, talk to us, and see if it's still an issue. Uh, we do find that in large installations, we'll have some folks who just can't shake it. And usually, and it's been my experience, that if we change the, they'll have a specified uh, product that'll have a certain uh, fiber uh, content. We look at some alternatives, and we can usually eliminate that. And in my experience, we've been able to eliminate that by altering. So a couple things. One, kind of knock some of the newness out of the, uh, out of the fabric, get some of the weight down by laundering, soften it up a little bit and or look for an alternative, and we've been able to eliminate it. I can't say universally that that's always worked, but in my experience, those things have typically happened. Now, the other outline factor is sometimes we see when people make a laundry provider change. Let's say I'm with Industrial Launderer X, new contract, new spec, it's won by Industrial Launderer Y. All of a sudden, my people start popping up with complaints that it's itchy, uncomfortable, I have rashes. When we go back and we audit that laundry facility, we find that their chemistries can be a little bit off. Usually by tweaking those, we get back to the pre-change conditions when there was no complaints of rashes, dermatitis, anything like that. So if it's something specific, we can usually research it, and we have a lot of resources to work through it. And I've yet to find, in my experience, one we haven't been able to solve to where someone just we just couldn't work with them, and it was continuing edu uh, problematic, and we couldn't get through it. So that's been my experience, and uh, hopefully that helped answer the question. Okay, thanks, Derek. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Um, I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question, but we will be sure to send those over to Derek, and I'm sure he'll get back with you. Um, my thanks to Derek for his presentation today, to Bulwark for sponsoring today's webinar, and to all of our participants. It is a busy season for Synergist webinars, and I hope you can join us for one or more of our upcoming events. 
On October 28th, Ronald McMahon from SGS Galson will present the new IH for the next normal. And on November 12th, Dave Wagner of Industrial Scientific will present gas detection in the 2020s, gas sensors and big data IoT. We also have a rescheduled product demo webinar that was originally planned for earlier this week. OHD's demonstration of their QuantiFit and QuantiCheck products will now be held on November 17th, and you can res register for all of these events at aiha.webvent.tv. All right. This was great. Thank you all. This actually concludes today's webcast. Thank you all for attending. The recording will be available at aiha.webvent.tv. We will send all registrants an email tomorrow with this link, and please visit our event calendar to sign up for future webcasts.